Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Friday, July 9th, we're studying Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 27 to 40. The Lord promises a new covenant to Israel, a covenant that he will write on their hearts, a covenant founded upon his forgiveness of their sins. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Jacob Dandy. Pastor Dandy serves at Zion Lutheran Church and School in Terrabella, California. Pastor Dandy, welcome back to Sharp Iron. It's a blessing to be here. As we get started this morning, Pastor Dandy, let's talk a little context. We're in Jeremiah 31, the second half. This is Jeremiah's book of comfort. We get a lot of good news in the midst of a lot of the law that Jeremiah has been preaching. What do we need to know about this part of the book, Jeremiah, his ministry, as we go into the text today? Yeah, just, well, and maybe with just the big, broad biblical picture here, um, generations earlier, um, we have similar things taking place in the kingdom of Israel. Um, and the kingdom of Israel uh, falls uh, and hardens themselves in continual idolatry. Uh, we see God raise up the Assyrians, and the uh, kingdom of Israel is uh, displaced, or destroyed. Uh, and now we see a very similar thing uh, taking place uh, in the midst of the kingdom of Judah and Jerusalem. They're facing the same judgment that Israel had faced uh, for their hardness of heart to the word of God, their hardness to uh, the uh, um, uh, covenant and promises of God, uh, and this is a result of them breaking God's covenant, the covenant that God had established with the people of Israel at Mount Sinai through Moses. Uh, this, this, and this, maybe to give an overarching idea of of what this really constitutes. That's the that's the law of God given at Mount Sinai. This is what establishes them. Um, as God's people, where he says, I will be your God, and you will be my people. Um, uh, and the people say, all the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And so that's the, the Ten Commandments, that's the law concerning the priest uh, and the uh, tabernacle, that's the law concerning uh, dietary restrictions, that's all of the stuff of the Old Testament. Um, and maybe if we were to kind of summarize that, it's to remember that God is God, and they are his creatures, and that he has established them as a people for his greater purposes, right? Uh, he says, uh, for example, in Exodus 20, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children of the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to a thousand generations to those who love me and keep my commandments. And so you have this idea uh, that as the people of Israel live under the care and the providence of God, they're called to be faithful to him. They're called to recall his law, to meditate on his word, to rest and find comfort in his promises, and to live according to his will. Um, at Mount Sinai, God gives his law and establishes his uh, what, what we'll call today, uh, later on, his old covenantal relationship with the people of Israel. Uh, and we ask why, why does he establish this? Why does God give the law? Why does he say, I will be your God and you will be my people. Uh, and God makes this covenant with Israel for the sake of revealing, uh, and really does ultimately reveal two great truths that we can describe as creation and redemption. That Israel and Judah were to be, lights to the nations and how they lived according to the will of God and these truths of God being the creator and us being his creatures would be revealed to the nations. Uh, God is more than just the God of Israel. God is more than just the God of the people of Judah, but he is the God of everything and everyone. And if God is God, then human adherence to the covenant is not an optional thing but it's the natural order of everything. God is God. We are his creatures. We're called to live under him according to his will. 
Uh, and that is what's revealed in God's covenant with Israel. It, what it means to be a creature. It's what it means to live under the care and the providence of the Lord. It's what it means to trust in God. And we also see the effects of the fall in the people of Israel who cannot by their own reason or strength live as these people. Uh, and when this reality is seen, when it sets in, when Israel's continued sin and rebellion and hardness is revealed amongst the people, uh, there's two things that can happen. There's either repentance or continued hardening of the heart. Uh, and the great sin that breaks the covenant is that Israel and Judah, um, and in the case of Jeremiah, Judah, choose to take the place of God. They choose to serve idols They uh, of human creation. It's really an inversion of the natural order where God is God, God is creator, we are creatures. It sets man on top and places false gods as a servant of man's will. Uh, and so we, we see that Jeremiah, um, throughout the Old Testament, has been, or throughout uh, the earlier parts of his book, is preaching against this inversion of the natural order. He's declaring that Israel and Judah, that Jerusalem, were already dead when Sennacherib and Nebuchadnezzar had shown up. Um, as the people are now living through the, the disaster of the fallingness of their kingdom, right? Um, he, he's this weeping prophet. And so God wants to warn his people. God sends Jeremiah to preach his word. Um, but as the children were hardened to his preaching, um, God hands them over to their desires. God hands them over um, to uh, their idolatry. He says, uh, if you are to worship these gods, well, these gods can save you, right? Return to me. But, uh, uh, it, you know, this, this whole thing continues to get worse and worse. Um, a guy named Paul Hensel, um, back in the day, uh, he wrote this book called The Hardening of Israel's Heart. And he talks about the spiritual condition of Judah at the beginning of the book of Jeremiah. And it says, this reprobate people would rather be dead than alive. Uh, this will come upon Judah because they committed a double sin. They've forsaken the well of living water. And at the same time, have hewn for themselves cisterns that give no water. They have exchanged their glory for useless idols. And even the heathen are not so stupid. Uh, and so uh, Isaiah, or sorry, Jeremiah, he preaches this hard truth to the people. Uh, Isaiah uh, tries to stand faith, or Jeremiah, I keep saying Isaiah, uh, stands uh, trying to be faithful um, uh, and proclaiming God's faithfulness to the covenant. Uh, but the faithlessness of Judah uh, is met with faithful warnings of God. Um, but the covenant now has been broken. And after many warnings, God causes this disaster to fall upon Israel. Babylon comes. Uh, and at the event of this conquest of Jerusalem, now Jeremiah speaks comfort. Uh, he speaks of the new covenant that God will establish with his people. Uh, he speaks of how God is going to... Uh, uh, re-establish his people as a people. Uh, and uh, this is to comfort. And ultimately, um, as we read through this, we're going to see that this this points to Christ. Mm. This is all about Jesus. Yeah, I appreciate all the context you gave concerning the old covenant, because that will help us with this, the meat of this text, which is that new covenant. Now, now there is more than that. That new covenant language comes up particularly in verses 31 through 34. Um, so we'll, we'll take a look at the, the whole text we've got for today. We're starting in verse 27. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and the seed of beast. And it shall come to pass that as I have watched over them to pluck up and break down, to overthrow, destroy, and bring harm, so I will watch over them to build and to plant, declares the Lord. In those days they shall no longer say, The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. But everyone shall die for his own sin. Each man who eats sour grapes, his teeth shall be set on edge. All right, I'll, I'll pause there. That was verses 27 through 30, which does form a bit of a unit here in, in our text. One of the things that stands out to me, Pastor Dandy, in verse 28, you get that repeat of Jeremiah's call language, this matter of plucking up, breaking mm -hmm. down, overthrowing, destroying, building and planting, and even, even the matter of the Lord watching over his word. Back in Jeremiah chapter 1, the Lord got 
uh, showed Jeremiah this almond tree and used that same language of watching over his word. So we definitely have a hearkening back here to Jeremiah's call in this section. What else do you see in these yeah. verses? Yeah, well, you know, you see a lot of uh, God's character in this. That, um, well, he, first of all, we see that, you know, he's echoing and calling back to quite a bit of the stuff he said with Jeremiah through his call. Uh, we also see this harken back to Isaiah chapters 10 and 11. Um, chapter 10, we uh, read in Isaiah, it says, In that day the remnant of Israel and the survivors of the house of Jacob will no more lean on him who struck them, but will lean on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. In truth, a remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, the mighty God. Uh, For though your people Israel be as sand of the sea, only a remnant of them will return, right? Uh, And so um, we we see that uh, Isaiah talked about this long before it happened, that uh, God's people in in the house of Judah um, would be struck, that they would be dispersed, that they would um, um, uh, face this destruction, but that God would preserve a remnant. Uh, We also see then uh, in chapter 11, of Isaiah, it says, "There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, a branch from his roots, and shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord." Right? That that there's going to be this um, uh, this this stump that's laid bare but from the stump is going to bear forth this righteous branch. And we, we, we acknowledge that and we read that um, uh, during the time of Advent and Christmas when we think about the, the coming of Christ. But what we see here um, being declared with the people of Israel is that God has been watching over his word and watching over his people. Um, and you get this idea of maybe tearing up or plucking up but then replanting, tearing up and reseeding. Um, and so when I read this, at least, I have this image of uh, where I live in California. There's just, there's orange groves and uh, nut trees and all of these things all around. And um, on occasion, you'll be, you'll be driving around in the country and you, you start looking around and you see that um, uh, an entire field of oranges has been uprooted. Right. They've they've kind of reached the point where they're they're either too old or too wild or too unproductive. And they'll send the bulldozer in and they'll, they'll pluck everything up. Um, they'll pile all the um, dead trees into a pile throughout the field and they'll burn them. Right. Uh, and so you get this image of just complete destruction. And it's kind of this, this unsettling thing, seeing this dead field in the midst of these great big orchards everywhere. Um, but what happens is that they always will replant, right? That they will, they will plant uh, good oranges. Uh, they'll plant good trees um, and that, that field will be reseeded. Um, and so the image I get of this at least is that um, as, as Israel is facing this, or Judah is facing this judgment of God, um, as they are um, really seeing the end and destruction of their nation, um, in, in a lot of regards, uh, you know, uh, Nebuchadnezzar has, has conquered. Um, God is now saying, I will replant. Um, my land will not be left barren and desolate. You, my people, will not be uh, set to an end. Uh, I will replant my land with my people. Um, uh, and that even though everyone who faces this judgment faces it because of their sin, their rejection of the covenant, um, there is still a covenant that I am going to recall. There's a covenant that I am going to remember, and it's actually the covenant that predates the one of Moses at Mount Sinai, um, that God is going to place a limitation on his wrath for the very precious purpose of his promises that go back prior to Exodus chapter 20, go back all the way to Genesis 3, where, where God uh, will recall his covenant given to Adam uh, in Genesis 3.15, that um, from the woman would be born a righteous seed. Uh, and so we have replanting language quite literally here, the righteous seed who will stomp out the serpent's head. 
and in Noah, where, where for the sake of that righteous seed, God promises not to overcome and destroy the earth with a great flood ever again. We have Abraham's promise and covenant with God, these older than the old covenant languages that really are the roots of the new covenant, where God promises Abraham that he would have children and descendants and that they would be a great nation that would inhabit the land, and from that land and that nation would come a blessing for all creation, namely Jesus. That's carried on to Jacob, and Jacob blesses Judah and says that the scepter will never depart from Judah, that there would be one of the Lord's anointed who reigns over all the people of Israel. It's carried on to David as David's promise that there would be eternally a son of David ruling over the people of God. And so God will preserve a remnant of the people of Judah. God will replant the land and replant the people. God will be faithful to this people because he's going to be faithful to his promise to send a savior out of love for his church, out of love for his elect, out of love for the creation, um, and faithfulness to save, he will reverse the fortunes of his people as they are facing the destruction. Um, and, you know, you, you see the basically the fall of their society um, uh, because of their hardened idolatry, because of their sin, uh, because of their rejection of the covenant. Their, their, their whole society, their whole lives are falling apart. Right, um, people are dying. It's a gruesome thing. It's a gruesome image, and it's it's probably not a fun thing to live through. But in the midst of it, God promises a reversal for His people, Israel and Judah, as they're both mentioned there in verse twenty-seven, um, because He's promising a return from exile and a resowing of Israel and Judah with the seed of man and beast. This this promise seed language once again that we get uh, in Genesis three that God is going to build up his people once again for the sake of Jesus, hmm. for the sake of his Savior who's going to come. I, I really like the way that you, you connect that seed language here to the, the promise of the seed in Genesis chapter 3. And, and as I was reading it, my mind too was, was going to some of those older covenant, even older than the Sinai, the covenant at Sinai. Um, I thought of Noah particularly with this this idea of, you know, like replanting and, and think of how the Lord brought mm-hmm. Noah and his family and all the animals off the ark with the command to be fruitful and multiply. And, and similarly, just that language that's used even in the creation that it, it's like the Lord here in bringing his people back from the exile, this is a new creation that he is is giving. I think that the language is reminiscent of that. And then, as you said, recalls the promise that's made when the when the fall happens, that the Lord will restore, will redeem through the promised seed. I think all of those those connections are here. And I think, you know, if, if we want to see this as new creation, then it makes sense that it's followed by new covenant. If, if the Lord's going to give yeah. a new creation, he's going to give a new covenant, which is where the text is heading. Any more on these, these verses through verse 30 before we start into the, what we says the meat, verses 31 through 34? Um. No, I think we're good. Let's move on. All right. So verses, yeah, that's that's great. The, like we said, the, I think the bulk of our conversation is going to center around these very familiar words. Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. That's Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34. This heart of this text, this new covenant language, maybe we could even say that the heart of this whole book of comfort, chapters 32 through 33, this text really is mm-hmm. is central. Uh, begin, we've got about, oh, seven or eight minutes before the break, Pastor Danny. Let's let's start into this this section. I'm sure we'll have more to say on the other side of the break as well. Yeah, so there, oh, there's so much to talk about here. Um, first, you know, we, we talk about uh, that there, there's this promise of coming days where he's going to make this new covenant. And what I find kind of special about this is that 
um, it's a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah that um, we, we have these, these two kingdoms of the divided monarchy um, that have been torn apart um, in more ways than one um, that were often warring factions with one another. Um, but as we, we see it, we see that God is going to be faithful to um, these faithless ones, right? Um, that, that, that the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, uh, that moved heavily over the people of Israel throughout their entire time after uh, the division of the monarchy, um, uh, uh, they remained. Though they were faithless, God is faithful. And though Israel is suffering, and Judah is going now and is currently suffering uh, because of their faithless actions to the covenant, God is going to be faithful to them. Uh, he's going to be faithful to, once again, the older covenants, this, these, these covenants that go back to Noah and Abraham and Adam, um, that he's going to be faithful in his work uh, of uh, bearing out the gospel of Jesus throughout history and throughout time. Uh, and this, this really tells us about the love of God. Um, that it is not founded on any righteousness of our own, but it's founded upon the righteousness of Christ and the forgiveness of sins. Because without the forgiveness of sins, um, Israel and Judah are worse off than the heathen nations of the world. Because they knew. They had the revelation. They had the word. They had the law. They had the promises. But it's what sets them apart and what sets Christianity as a whole apart is the forgiveness of sins that we are blessed recipients of God's work of forgiveness. And that's what makes this new covenant so spectacular. Um, uh, you know, God, God also uses marriage language here. He, he says, they broke my covenant, even though I was their husband, declares the Lord. Um, and you know, I was just recently in my devotions uh, reading through um, the book of Hosea. Right, and we we have in Hosea this image of a faithless wife, um, and what does the faithful husband do? What does uh, Hosea do with his faithful uh, prostitute of a wife? He pursues her. Um, he he ha- he's continually sent by God to reclaim and to redeem his wife, um, and this is what God is doing here. It's it's like this reconciliation of a faithless spouse. Um, this one who breaks marriage vows, this one who has um, uh, run around uh, behind their spouse's back. Uh, and what is God doing? He's going to take his, his faithless bride and he's going to restore her and make her his own. And it's, it's uh, once again, um, and it's, it, it can only happen through the forgiveness of sins. Um, it's, it can only happen through uh, this, this love that is born out in the gospel. It's God pursues and God loves um, his, his faithless wife, and he's going to be faithful to his covenant with her, his promise with her, uh, and he is going to remain her husband. Um, uh, it may be reminiscent. Um, in the one-year lectionary um, just this past week, uh, we had the uh, parables of the lost. We have the lost sheep, lost son, lost coin. Um, and we're pa- given this picture of God who patiently pursues and waits for uh, the repentance of his beloved, um, his, his beloved son or that beloved lost sheep. And he rejoices uh, to bring them back. He rejoices to bring them back through his own. He rejoices to forgive. Uh, and that's that's the type of God that we have, um, and it's all rooted in that gift of goodness. Hmm. Yeah, I mean that that language of Israel as bride, Lord as husband. That was that was Jeremiah too. It's like he was drawing from Hosea at the beginning of his book, where mm-hmm. where you get that over and over again. How 
the Lord was faithful, but his people were unfaithful. And that, that same image showed up over and over again. And here in this new covenant, the Lord's going to, you know, with that forgiveness of sins, which is so key to this new covenant, the Lord is going to make right what his people had had made wrong. And in that we do, we see the picture of the love of God, the faithfulness of God in this new covenant. And we're going to keep digging into that on the other side of the break. You're listening to Sharper Iron here on KFUO, looking at Jeremiah chapter 31 with Pastor Jacob Dandy. We'll be right back. Please stick around. Since 1978, Lutheran Church Extension Fund has had the humble privilege of supporting Lutheran Church Missouri Synod Ministries and her workers. Thanks to faithful investors, LCEF has provided thousands of church workers, congregations, schools, and organizations with the low-cost loans and resources they need to reach more people with the saving name of Christ. To learn more, visit lcef.org or call 800-843-5233. 800-843-5233. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Friday, July 9th. We're studying Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 27 to 40 with Pastor Jacob Dandy. He serves at Zion Lutheran Church and School in Terrabella, California. Pastor Dandy, prior to the break, we were looking at this central section of our text and really the whole book of comfort, the new covenant that the Lord promises. We're talking about how we see in this the love of God, the faithfulness of God for even his faithless people. This is a very familiar text, I think, to many because it it shows up at very key moments in the life of the church. How do we see this Mm -hmm. text in the life of the church? How do we see it especially fulfilled in our Lord Jesus Christ? Yeah, so, um, you know, this new covenant, this new life that we have in Christ, um, for those of us who uh, participate in the divine service on Sundays, Right. Um, this this word new covenant or new testament or anything like that should really cause our ears to perk up um, just from hearing week in and week out the words of institution. Um, as Jesus says, uh, on the night that he was betrayed, he gives the, he takes the bread, he gives thanks, he break it, breaks it. And he says, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also takes the cup after supper, saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As for as, and then Paul adds on to this in 1 Corinthians 11. He says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so the, the new covenant is the forgiveness that Jesus wins for us on the cross. That's, that's really the heart and soul and the center of it. And this is the only covenant that can really stand eternally because it's the covenant that is not um, violable, not violated by our sinful flesh, uh, but it's the covenant that stands strong on its own. The gospel of Jesus stands. Um, uh, those, this is the something that the will and the work and the sinful nature that man has cannot add to um, and cannot tear down. Uh, uh, we cannot tear down the forgiveness won for us by the death of the Son of God. It's it's greater than we are. We can say we want no part of it, um, and that's really what the sinful flesh wants to do at times. But um, uh, this thing stands eternally um, as as the thing that brings us comfort and joy. Uh, and we see this kind of echoed throughout the New Testament. This this particular passage um, is is repeated. In the New Testament, um, uh, by Paul uh, in Romans chapter 11, where he he's talking about the inclusion of the Gentiles in the kingdom of God, right? Uh, as the Gentiles are grafted in, uh, and that uh, the people of Israel are are um, uh, actually um, uh, hopefully included in that um, uh, by seeing the faith of the Gentiles. Uh, we also see this in uh, Hebrews chapter 8. This this whole uh, verses 31 through 34 um, is quoted uh, in, in Hebrews chapter 8 to talk about how this, this is the covenant that stands. 
um, on its own, that it's, it's a ministry that is more excellent. It's a work that's more excellent, excellent than the old covenant because it enacts great promises of God, that it enacts the gospel. Um, uh, it, it's the one that fulfills the old covenant, that it brings life, um, uh, to the people of God. Uh, through the forgiveness of sins. And then we see also uh, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 um, that we are ministers of the new covenant, um, that we are ministers of the new covenant according to the Spirit of God, right? That um, that the Spirit gives life through the forgiveness of sins, that, um, uh, that God uh, makes us sufficient members of his kingdom, uh, uh, for sufficient members of Christ, not by works of our own, not works of the flesh or adherence to the old law, but by the work of the Holy Spirit to create sustaining and saving faith in Jesus. And so we see that uh, the, the life of the new covenant is centered around the cross of Christ. Um, uh, it is, it is the, the blood that seals that covenant and our participation in that is through faith in receiving the forgiveness of sins. And we, we live that out as the Church of God um, as we celebrate the Lord's Supper together. And so uh, this new covenant is still quite lively, alive, and well, and at work in the people of God, uh, especially when we gather together for worship. So, and I think this this text from Jeremiah 31, these particular verses, shows up at least one of the years on Monday, Thursday, in the three-year mm-hmm. lectionary. When when we hear Jeremiah talking about this new covenant, the Lord saying he's going to make a new covenant, we should be thinking as Christians today of, at least in part, our participation in the sacrament of Christ's body and blood. Yes, yeah. Um, and, and I think, actually, if we, we look at verse 31, um, we, we get that image even more clearly um, because it's the language that we get in the Old Testament. We say, God says, I will make a new covenant. Um, it's actually um, uh, uh, this, this word uh, to cut a covenant. That's, and that was the language in Hebrew that you would, that you would cut a covenant. And, and that, that idea there is that you would um, actually cut sacrificial flesh, right? That there, um, when a covenant was made between two parties, um, that uh, it was solemnized by the blood of a sacrifice, right? And we see that um, in, in the image of the people of Israel, when they agree to the covenant that God makes at Mount Sinai, um, that they, they, they butcher uh, bulls, and what do they do? They sprinkle the blood upon the people of Israel. Um, we see that in God's covenant with Abraham, where Abraham has this image of uh, um, these these hewn uh, animals, uh, and that that God, uh, in the image of a, a cook pot, passes between these animals, so that that there is this blood of sacrifice that solemnizes and ratifies a covenant. Um, and so we we see that that takes place in the old covenant. Um, uh, and it continues to take place in the old covenants through the, the priestly sacrifices and the, you know, works of sacrifice at the temple. But we see that the new covenant is also a cutting of the covenant that is solemnized by not the blood of goats or beast or, um, uh, or anything like that, but by the blood of Jesus. Um, and, and we have a participation in the body and the blood of Christ. Uh, as we gather for holy worship, we are living in that new covenant, um, and that new covenant is is really all about the forgiveness that God bears out for his people through the death of his son. In verse 33, Pastor Dandy, the Lord says that this new covenant that he's going to make is going to be written on the hearts of the people. Why, why that image mm-hmm. with the new covenant? Yeah, and so we remember at Mount Sinai, the, the Old Covenant um, was written on the, the tablets of stone that Israel might remember them, uh, that it was written on these, these stone tablets and set before the people. Um, uh, we, we see that the, the original stone tablets even, um, uh, the covenant is broken before they are even shown to the people. Right. Um, as we have that whole affair of the golden calf. But uh, we, we have the tablets of the law of God uh, uh, and uh, we see that 
that as it's written on stone, it's engraved so that it might be seen forever. Um, it's broken. And so God doesn't write it on stone, but he writes it and engraves it upon the flesh of our hearts. Um, you know, we, we once again, thinking about the divine service, um, you know, we, we sing uh, with King David. Uh, the offertory at the end of, after every sermon, it's the create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Um, that the, and we remember that the law is no longer set before God's people as this external requirement. But in the new covenant, it, it is, it is engraved upon our hearts in a way that it governs the lives of the faithful by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, and so we, we get this image that you know, just because God's making a new covenant that, you know, you could very easily say, okay, so the law of God's abolished. Um, the, the, the requirements that God calls to his people to be his creatures, um, to live under him once again as God over all flesh, over all things, and to live according to his will with joy. Um, we could say, well, that's abolished now um, under the forgiveness of sins. And, you know, we get certain sects of Christianity that try to do that from time to time. But that's not what this is saying. It's not saying that the old covenant is abolished, but it's superseded by the new covenant, where there is this new willful obedience through faith in Christ, that as we receive this forgiveness from God, that we, um, by this working of the Holy Spirit, um, by this, this, this outpouring of the love of God for us, uh, now strive to rejoice in the law of God. We, we strive to uphold um, the, um, uh, uh, the eternal moral law of God uh, that we receive in the Ten Commandments, that we strive to and delight in um, serving this God who has loved us and saved us. And so our, our hearts are actually um, uh, brought from being, uh, and, and maybe you've got this stone and flesh image, um, that our hearts are brought from being um, hearts of stone, but they're softened um, to the, the work of God and the love of God that is poured out for us through this new covenant of Christ. Yeah, that, that image of the the heart, I think, is, is important to keep in the context of Jeremiah. Jeremiah's had some pretty... Uh, harsh things to say about the heart of people previously. He said the heart is sick above all things. It's deceitfully sick, he said in, in chapter 17. Mm-hmm. And so to, to have this heart here, you know, you brought out from the liturgy that creating me a clean heart, I think is, is an excellent verse to, to bring to bear here because if the Lord's just going to write this on my sinful heart, then that's no good. But he's actually going to give me a new heart. And he, he's going to do that here through the forgiveness of sins. And that's where I think verse 34 comes into play. So, so important that we, we see the foundation of this new covenant as the forgiveness of sins the, that's won for us by the blood of Christ. That's the way God cuts this covenant with us by sacrificing his own son to forgive our sins, to give us mm-hmm. new hearts, to write his His covenant on our hearts, to keep us in him. And, and ultimately, so that we will be his people, and he will be our God to return to that Exodus language. And, and now that becomes ours in the Christian church. This is what God is doing in, in his in His son, Jesus Christ. Final thoughts on, on this section, Pastor Danny, before we move on to the rest of our text for today. Well, I, I just think it's a, a beautiful image of the life of the church and the fulfillment of the will of God, that as, as we human creatures— Really, you know, by our sinful nature, um, our rebellious against our Creator, God does this new and wonderful thing. He works this new and wonderful thing, and He makes us into His own. He shapes us as His own people, um, and He He can take these these hardened idolaters and say, "I am going to write my law upon your heart," um, and the thing that will soften your heart is that I will forgive your sins. Um, you know, as just as, as a human being, when somebody is being obstinate against me, uh, my temptation is to be obstinate against them. And so if one of my children is being uh, um, disobedient and defiant, my, my instinct as a father is to, you know, discipline them and punish them. Um, and, and God certainly does this. But um, the ultimate instinct of our God is greater and goes beyond that. He also forgives them. He removes their iniquity. 
And that's, that's the thing that makes the Christian. That's the thing that brings you into the new covenant. It's the forgiveness of sins. Um, it, it, you know, we, we cannot even begin as Christians to emphasize this enough that, that the thing that sets us apart from any religion or ethos or anything is that God forgives sinners through Jesus. And that's just the most beautiful thing that we have here in this text. As he says, I will remember their sins no more. And, and that does propel us forward into the rest of the text, that, that forgiveness of sins, the remembrance of sins no more, does move us forward as the Lord continues to make his promises. So we're picking up again in Jeremiah 31, now at verse 35. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, declares the Lord, then shall the offspring of Israel cease from being a nation before me for forever. Thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth below can be explored, then I will cast off all the offspring of Israel for all that they have done, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the city shall be rebuilt for the Lord from the tower of Hananel to the corner gate. And the measuring line shall go out farther, straight to the hill Gareb, and shall then turn to Goa, the whole valley of the dead bodies and the ashes, and all the fields as far as the brook Kidron, to the corner of the horse gate toward the east, shall be sacred to the Lord. It shall not be uprooted or overthrown any more forever. That's the rest of our text for today. That's Jeremiah 31, 35 to 40. Pastor Danny, I think this breaks down pretty nicely into two main sections. In the first part, the Lord Mm -hmm. uses images from nature again to say something. And in the second part, he's talking about the city of Jerusalem. So let's talk about that first part, verses 35 through 37. Uh, What what do we see there? Yeah, so like you said, we get these images of nature, right? And so we, we, we have God call his creation as a witness for him, right? Um, he's saying, hey, have you noticed how every day the, the sun gives light and that every day the, the moon shines uh, according to its time and according to its cycles and that there are stars in the sky and they're pretty predictable depending on where you're standing upon the face of the earth to be in certain places at certain times. And have you ever noticed that um, when you go and stand on the seashore, there's 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 tides and there's there's waves? Well, remember I made that. Um, remember I I I have ordered and built this creation. Uh, and and as you look at this and you see this, um, and this all happens according to my will, according to my order, according to how I made it to work. Um, and Tomorrow, you can be certain the sun will come up. Um, to, uh, tomorrow, you'll be certain uh, that the sun uh, and the moon and the stars will be in their proper places, that the tides will be at their predictable flows. Um, you can also trust in what I'm saying here, um, that, that my, my order um, coincides and works with my promise. As creation has worked orderly according to the way I made it, so will my promises work out. My promises will do what I've proposed them to do. They will work out according to the ways that I have promised that they will work out. Um, uh, And so I promise that I'm going to replant Israel and Judah in the land. I've promised my new covenant. I've promised that I'm going to send a Savior into the world. Um... And that is going to happen just as predictably um, uh, in an unpredictable way, but predictably as the sun comes up in the morning. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, in the same way that as the heavens are, are immeasurable, as, well, you know, even us and our great science and all our satellites really can't tell you how big the universe is. Um, and uh, there, there are parts of this planet that we will will we still are unable to explore um, how vast God's creation is, um, uh, that God will still continue. He still has this vast forgiveness for his people. Uh, He still will continue to care for his people and support his Israel. He will still continue to do all of these things for his people. Um, That this covenantal relationship with God 
uh, is through faith in Christ, and uh, this will be proclaimed, this will be working out for the people of God, this will be working out for the Church of Jesus to the very end. It just so that, that we make this point clear, Pastor Danny, because I think in our day and age it's important, this Israel of God, these offspring of Israel that will not cease from being a nation before me forever, that's the church, the Christian church, not yeah. any nation state. Yeah. Um, you know, um, we, and we remember, you know, this is not a Zionistic proclamation about the nation of Israel or anything like that, but this is really about who has Jesus as their king, right? Um, the, 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 this nation that God establishes isn't a earthly nation. Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world, right? But it's, it's namely, it's the people who live in this covenantal relationship with Jesus. It's the church. You know, St. Paul makes it very clear in Romans chapter 9. He says, not all Israel is Israel. That the true Israel is not um, a, a nation of people, um, a or, or a geopolitical nation of people who live in a certain time in a certain place right now um, and govern um, uh, according to earthly authority and earthly rule. But the true people of Israel are those who are uh, the ones who believe in the promised seed, the ones who believe in Christ, um, who has come to be the Savior, that those who have Christ Jesus set as king over them in their church and who receive and participate in this new covenant. Um, it's, it's not a, a, a foreign earthly power, but it is a, the, the power of the gospel um, enacted um, in the lives of human beings. Pastor Danny, then in verses 38 to 40, we move now to the city of Jerusalem. We get some markers that, I don't know if I pronounced them correctly or not. I did the best I could. But we get these markers around the city of Jerusalem in these days that are coming. What is the Lord promising about the city of Jerusalem? And what does that mean for the church in verses 38 through 40? Yeah. And so um, verses 38 to 40, um, you know, basically you have east and west. Um, uh, you know, between these landmarks that will be sacred to the Lord, right? Um, in short term, this means that um, God will restore the holy city and the temple worship and all of that stuff, right? Um, and so there's going to be an end to the exile. God's people are going to return to the their, their apportioned inheritance, and um, they're going to uh, work um, uh, to rebuild this, and they are going to worship in anticipation of this coming Messiah uh, and the uh, in action um, in the flesh of the new covenant at the birth and the life and the ministry, death and resurrection of Jesus, right? Um, and so short term, this means that Jerusalem will be rebuilt, the temple worship will be restored for a time. Um, but then, uh, as we who live in the New Testament see that God also is going to then maintain his eschatological promise, uh, given in Christ to gather his faithful unto himself. That, um, that the temple of God is no longer a temple made, uh, from stones, uh, hewn by human hands. Um, but the temple of God is the church and body of Christ. Uh, and that the the um, uh, people of God are sacred as God gathers him. Un- uh, we see this ultimately uh, in in Revelation chapter twenty one, um, or was it twenty two? Uh, yeah, Revelation twenty one verse two, uh, where we we get this description of the new heavens and the new earth and. Um, and we see the holy city, the new Jerusalem, uh, adorned as a bride adorned for her husband. Um, and we see, look, the dwelling place of God is with man. Uh, he will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be their God. Once again, what's that? That's the language of the covenant, yeah. that, that we will be his people, he will be our God, and he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning crying, no pain anymore, for those former things have passed away. And so we, we see here that um, ultimately this is a uh, in the times promise given in Christ that God will gather his faithful unto himself, uh, and that once again God will dwell with his people, that we will be together united with him in eternity, 
And that's all rooted in the new covenant. It's all rooted in the shedding of the uh, Lamb of God's blood that takes away the sin of the world. It's rooted in forgiveness of sins that uh, we have in Christ dying for us on the cross. As you brought out that Revelation passage, it is amazing how often that language from the Exodus shows up that, that God will be our God, we will be his people, and it's connected to the covenant every time, the old covenant and now the new covenant in Christ. This is God's goal, is to make us his people so that that we would dwell with him forever. And I think that, I mean, that's certainly present there in Revelation. It's present here in Jeremiah chapter 31, that the Lord wants to dwell with his people. And, and ultimately, that, of course, points us to the, the incarnation of our Lord in, in whom, you know, God tabernacled among us. He, he dwells among us to be our God so that we will be his people. It, it keeps pointing us back to Christ all, all, all the time. Pastor Danny, we've got about four minutes here on the morning. I'd love to hear your final reflections on the text as a whole and the ways that that this text from Jeremiah 31 points us to Christ crucified and risen, the the bringer of the new covenant of the forgiveness of sins to you and to me. Yeah, well, and just a few things to just reflect on and remember um, as we look at this text. First, that that God does measure his wrath, um, and he measures his wrath for the sake of Christ. And so as Judah is in the midst of turmoil and disaster, God speaks these words of comfort to them. Uh, He says, you know, I'm not going to utterly wipe you from the face of the earth because I will not utterly wipe my gospel from the face of the earth. I have a covenant and a promise with you. Um, And though uh, we are faithless, he is faithful. And though that we fall short, God is um, going to be a God who is going to keep his promises. Um, and we see that that promise is borne out in the incarnation of Jesus, that, that God, like a faithful spouse, pursues his faithless wife. And how does he make her his bride again? How does he adorn her? Well, he adorns her in the righteousness of his son. He adorns her in the righteousness of Jesus, as we, we see that um, in that Revelation chapter 21 passage, um, it's uh, uh, the new Jerusalem is adorned as a bride prepared for her bridegroom, that we are adorned, prepared for our bridegroom through the righteousness of Jesus, that Jesus uh, washes us to present us to himself without spot or wrinkle. Um, that he forgives us our sins, that he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And how does he do that? Well, he cuts the covenant. He ratifies his covenant in his blood. He pours out his blood for us. He sheds his blood for us that we might have forgiveness of sins and be made participants in the kingdom of God, that we might be drawn to him, that we might know him as our God, and that we might be his people, and that we might live according to his care and his love, that he writes his law upon our hearts, that he shatters our hearts of stone and gives us hearts of flesh so that we rejoice in the work and the will and the promises of God because he forgives sinners. Um, and this forgiveness of sins is just absolutely 100% dependable, just as much as the sun comes up and the sun sets and the moon rises and the cycles of creation continue on, God will forgive sinners. Um, and he will forgive you and me, and we, we receive this in the joyful worship of the church as we eat and drink the body and blood of Christ given and shed for us. Uh, and so that is just just an immense amount of comfort that we see the character and the love of our God. Pastor Jacob Dandy is the pastor at Zion Lutheran Church and School in Terrabella, California, helping us today with Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 27 to 40. Pastor Dandy, thanks for being our guest today. It has been a joy. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. If you have any questions about the book of Jeremiah, comments on the series, we'd love to hear from you. Send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org or use the app and the open mic feature there to record up to a 60-second message to send to us. We love to hear from you. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again next week.